ways to go, and uh, some ground we got uh, to cover. And so let's uh, look at uh, this portion. Uh, what we're dealing with is the time on Sunday, we're doing the religious spirit. Now, I do want to make you aware, this is a, 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 perhaps some of the topic that we'll, that we'll get into may be a little bit uncomfortable uh, at times, but it may be uh, a, little, a little close to home. Uh, and uh, you may feel uh, as if, you know, wow, I'm getting with this. It's good though. It's, it's important for us to uh, look at the gospel. If we are going to be uh, right with God, we have to be uh, corrected, uh, shaped, reshaped, recalibrated, so on and so forth, building our, our care for more our life uh, in our walk with God. Uh, as we go through this lesson today, uh, if, if you're feeling uncomfortable, but because uh, you find yourself somewhere uh, in the teaching, uh, whereas uh, that religious spirit works within you. Uh, or if, uh, as you're tracking the lesson, if you feel like you're looking around and you're saying, yep, that's a uh, son of God. I'm finally glad that you told them all, good job, that's good, wonderful. Then it's probably you that we just lesson too, because it's a religious spirit that's working. Uh, in you. Um, now I'll, I'll start today uh, by telling you this is a personal anyway for me because uh, as I teach this lesson uh, many years ago, uh, God delivered me from uh, a uh, religious spirit that I uh, found out later on, didn't know it at the time, but that I did have. Uh, and now that He has freed me from it, uh, I look back now and almost in a gross sense uh, to think that. Uh, I was this way, and that was me. Uh, so it, it, it is uh, appalling uh, to think that, that this, for me, this is my own personal testimony. Uh, and I apologize for you that you that that was me. Uh, but I'll, I'll say this to you. It makes you feel uncomfortable. If you like somebody else, you need deliverance. Uh, but it's not impossible. You can't do that. That would not be a living testimony. God can't deliver you from that. Uh, and it is such a liberating feeling. Uh, to, to know that God has freed you from uh, things like this. Uh, so as we get to the lesson and, and, and we're not going to go through that anymore. Alright, uh, go ahead and turn to Matthew, the 16th chapter, and then put a bookmark or so in the 23rd chapter of Matthew. Uh, it's just a foundation of concepts of a lesson. Uh, we're not going to be intent to turn to Matthew 16, 23. It's not to uh, teach a Bible lesson about the text itself. We've done this already in Matthew. Um, our intention here is just to point out the spirit that's working there uh, so that we'll have a strong premise with which to uh, launch this particular uh, lesson. Uh, in the second chapter of Matthew, Jesus left the, uh, the religious leaders and he's going over to the other side uh, with his disciples. And as he uh, launches out with them, he says this, look at verse number five, uh, well, verse number six, pardon me. Uh, he tells them to be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees uh, and also the Sadducees. Uh, these two are religious sects of people, groups of categories of religions uh, in that day, uh, having differing uh, concepts. One of the major differing concepts is in reference to uh, the resurrection. Those and that, that would be a, a life uh, after this. Those are two major varying concepts between the two. Uh, but then, nonetheless, there is a religious sect or religious people of, of that day. Jesus says, Be aware or be unwashed against the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, the people thought, or the disciples are thinking themselves, Jesus is talking about bread. So the thing in terms of, uh, He's after us or He's pointing out the fact that we've got to be great. So now they're, they're thinking to themselves that we messed up, uh, and Jesus, knowing what they're, they're thinking, that we messed up because we bread, He shows them that you're thinking too natural. He's surprised. What well, that the essence is, uh, He said, them, uh, you still haven't got it yet. Because uh, you should know by now, I'm not talking about the natural. You've seen me do food miracles before. We've seen Jesus on two different occasions uh, being masked with people with uh, the food miracles. Now, he did several food miracles, but these two particular ones, on the beginning of 5,000, even 4,000, which are actually cited uh, in the 16th chapter in that discourse. Uh, so 
So he said, I've been to 5,000 people, you remember that? I've been to 4,000, you remember that too? So he's not about bread that I'm, I'm talking to you about. Look at verse number 11. Uh, he wants them uh, to understand how would they be know that that means there's no reference to bread. So be aware, he says, of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And once again, so the 12th verse says, it was then at that moment they understood that he did not tell them to be aware of the leaven of bread, that is, the yeast in bread, but he's referring to the teaching of the Sadducees. So, uh, Jesus, uh, who was on the issue? We've seen through the miraculous before. Jesus referred to their lack of faith or their lack of kingdom uh, insight, their lack of understanding. So when he says to be aware, that means to hold your mind, be cautious of, or pay attention to, or put in the front of your mind, uh, that is what he says, of the leaven, which in the track place is literally yeast. He's using yeast as a figure of speech, by the metaphor, to, to refer back to something, a, a revelation in terms uh, of teaching and he's referring to yeast as uh, teaching. Uh, he holds it to the doctrine of the Pharisees. He says that their teaching is like yeast. Uh, it becomes uh, secretive. It, it is uh, uh, pervasive. It appears to be silent, but it can also be corrupted. For those who are tracking this, you want to know this concept that yeast has a double meaning. Double meaning. Uh, so it can be good, it can be evil, but it's based on the context with which it's in. Now, think about this. Uh, serpents in the Bible are, are not necessarily evil. Uh, well, Pastor, how can you say that? Because we're thinking of, of, in terms of you know, the, the serpent being possessed by uh, the devil. But Jesus tells uh, the disciples and his followers this be wise uh, as a serpent, but harmless. As a dove. So if he is, if a serpent in itself is evil, then why is Jesus telling him to be wise like a serpent? Uh, so the serpent in of itself is not uh, evil. The, the serpent is not. It's the context with which the serpent is held. So if you are uh, having a dream, in your dream, the serpent is black, it's probably something that, that is dark or deathly or demonic. If it's brown, it's probably human. If it's yellowish, it's, it's uh, also. Uh, if it's gold, it's probably wisdom. If it's white, it indicates purity. But it's still a wisdom. What changes the kind of wisdom it is, is the color and the emotions uh, of it. So leaven in itself uh, can be a positive thing, but we, we, we find that in the 13th chapter of Matthew, where Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, but I want to mix in the dough, showing that the kingdom of heaven, which it should be because yeast is effervescent, it should change the texture. Yeah. That you as a kingdom citizen, when you walk in the room, the whole room should become effervescent. It should begin to spring to life uh, because of, of who you are. Now go over to the 13th chapter uh, of, of Matthew. In Matthew 13, uh, just coming out of the faith of the Pharisees and the scribes, they had been going back and forth in chapter 22. Now what Jesus does, he begins to point out uh, who they are for what they do. And that's what he's saying, that they preach to you one thing, but they practice something else. That they're confessing uh, to live like this, but you'll find out that they don't do exactly what they say. You know, uh, something like that, put it in practical terms. It'd be like a pastor calling the church on a fast, but then you see the pastor uh, at the corner diner eating breakfast while the rest of the church that is fasting. It's, it's kind of productive because he's, he's having to do something that he himself, you know, uh, is not doing. But I, I have a pastor friend of mine, I don't tell you that he's named to anybody, I guess he's been related to science, so I, I try to avoid those kind of things. The pastor friend tells me, I hate pastors. And he says, he'll, but he does encourage the church to pass and calls for the church, but he himself uh, won't do it because he doesn't like the pastor. So I'm thinking to myself, well, then don't call for the church. If you're not going to pass, it's just that poor uh, leadership, you know, practice, you know, which preach. And so, uh, that's the concept. Uh, he said that they even practice the same thing that they're, they're uh, placing on you. That is to say, they'll lay a heavy burden on you, but they won't do the burden themselves. Uh, so we kind of fascinated some of the icons, uh, preacher icons that we have today. You know, uh, some of them, you know, they, they, they will, they get themselves in honor bearers, and, and, and before, they weren't never anybody's honor bearers, but they now leave them because they're so important, they have honor bearers, 
And then we can open our slice up their shoes or put their coat and stuff on. Did I say that? I say that. But anyway, you know, they do it for next but they would never lace up somebody else's shoes. So I'm saying, bro, rock this. But you free. Because hey, you know, uh, if you if God be able to walk in that in that point or, or place of servitude, I've got some uh, scriptures to back it up in a moment more. Uh, he says, what they do is that they, they do things that they observe by, by men. They have broad phylacteries. Uh, you can, for those of you who look at the word phylactery, you can just Google it and you'll see phylacteries on Google to see the image. Phylacteries are wide, broad uh, leather bands that can be wrapped around the arm. They generally use on holy, holy days, feast days, etc. They have scriptures on them that the person they use for uh, times of meditation, deep prayer, etc. And he says that what they're doing is they make the phylacteries wider. Than normal. Why? Because they, they want to be seen as if their phylacteries are wider. They look holy because they have wider phylacteries. They have their tassel and the tile longer than others because they want they want by their tassels and those zits they want to look like you know they're they're quite impressive. It, it can be similar to you know someone wearing slain uh, beautiful robes and having the chain across their, their chest to appear as if because they have on this nice flowy uh, dazzling robe with this uh, chain across their chest and they, and they walk in with the music hype stuff and uh, they're going like oh. and uh, I really uh, these kind of concepts will be scary because I've seen places been in places where you know the saints have been worshiping and, and then all of a sudden uh, someone uh, the bishop or apostle or someone walks in and they stop the praise and worship that all the saints uh, stand in order for yeah. the bishop, the pastor, they, they were, and the, but then they uh, come in. I'm thinking you won't stand for Jesus, but you want them to stand for the preacher, the preacher, the pastor. Also, same for that as that person coming in. Someone comes in, and you know they're they're in high words, and all of a sudden that, that preacher that, that they love comes in like oh, you know, all happy. I'm thinking, well, no, we're not here to worship them. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's for demonstration, it, it, it's, uh, it's for show. And Jesus points that out. He said, they like important places to sit. Verse 6 and 7, you see it after 23. They like places of important places uh, to sit. Meaning then, what they do is they have special seats, special seats where, where they're seated. And I'm almost intimidated sometimes when I go places because I walk into church and I see these big thrones, you know, in the pulpit and I'm thinking, wow. Now, who's going to sit there? It's like this huge throne that a king uh, sits in. And uh, they like important places of, of honor. They like the titles. They like to be uh, recognized. But the Bible tells us this. Please look at uh, verse 11. The greatest among you shall be uh, your servant. So we know serve your rank. Your rank will be determined by your service. Your rank is determined by a service. So the greatest among you is the servant. Because your rank is determined by your service. Now let's just figure this out. Uh, for those of you who read through the feed, feeding miracles of Jesus, 5,000, 4,000, let's just, based on context clues, when did Jesus eat? Did he eat after he broke the bread and the fish? And then ate first and then gave it to the disciples? Or did he break it, bless it, give it, and then ate what was left over? Now, if Jesus is saying, he that is grace among you, let him be the servant of all, I have to ask this question. When do servants eat? You should tell me last. Right. So if Jesus is the grace among you, then he's not eating first, he's eating <laughs> Last. So it's kind of scary to get in because, you know, we have this place where you know, the saints can't eat until the pastor eats first. When the pastor eats first, then now the saints uh, can begin uh, to eat. But it's, it's contradictory to the, what the scripture says. The greatest among you is supposed to be the, the servant of, of, of all. So if you exalt yourself, you'll be humble. If you humble yourself, he says, you shall be uh, exalted. Uh, so what I want to do now is... I point out to you, and, and, and there's a huge chunk, huge chunk of what I'll have on the screen that will not be uh, in your notes. I'm just going to that now. I had, when I finished it out, I had about 17 pages. You guys have four. And I chose not to kill a tree uh, in order to give you uh, these notes. Uh, 
for many reasons. One, I didn't want the picture to go to waste and someone just can't put it aside. Um, and so I did have something earlier come and tell me I want all, all of those, all pages. And so most of the pages are those. But I didn't want it to go to waste and not be reviewed. So I wasn't going to give away all that paper and uh, it not be reviewed over and over again because there's a lot of information. You know, so anyway, uh, I don't know. Uh, let's not do that. But I, I was, dude, I was typing for you. You probably want to get this on DVD uh, uh, or etc. There, 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 there is a video on YouTube, so there's a video on demand, etc. And so those who are watching online, I'll touch you down, but you can also watch the later videos as well. There are eight walls in chapter 23. I'm going to race through those. It's not the, the lessons I do want to get you to see that there are walls are extreme judgments. Uh, God is angry, and so he gives a woe uh, because uh, it is an extreme warning. It's not your normal warning. Like, whenever you hear the word woe, it is an extreme uh, warning. So let's look at, let's track through here, and we'll see uh, eight woes. Uh, the first woe is done in, in verse number 13. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, because of hypocrites. That means you're pretending to be something you're really not. For uh, you should know the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. In other words, he's saying that uh, they can't get in because you're not going in and you're having to live something that you're not yourself are, are living. In other words, you're not practicing what you preach. So that there is that you're disordered, they're going to be disordered as well. Number two uh, is found in verse number 14. What do you try to compare us to the hypocrites? He says, you devour those houses and for pretense you make long prayers. Uh, it says, therefore you will, you will receive the greater condemnation. In other words, he's saying that you are oppressing individuals and you're all into this for, for uh, covenant acts and you're pretentious. In other words, when you pray, you're praying uh, pretentiously, uh, not because of a, a relationship with God, but you're praying uh, because uh, you want to be seen by people uh, that you pray. Now, let me say this. When I speak about religion, religion in itself is not a bad word. And so please don't misinterpret that because people will often say that today. Religion simply means practice. So you can have a practice or be religious about combing your hair. You can be religious about brushing your teeth. Those are good things. We want you to brush your teeth. We want you to comb your hair. Uh, they saw it saying yes, and the hygienist says, please, you know, brush your teeth. Uh, so then these are, you can be religious about many things that are, are positive, but what we're speaking here is about confessing something that you're really not uh, following the, that we are motive off uh, when you do this. So he says, you, you oppress other people, and in other words, you're giving them undue burdens. Let's think this through, brothers and sisters. Uh, that's something like uh, you come in and, uh, you know, because you're, you're this grand preacher and you're, you're holding things up, first of all, because we got to work the next morning, but you're holding service up and you won't, uh, and because you came late and you want to hold them longer while you're there, and then you expect them to make dinner for you after service is over, and that sister has got to go home. Uh, and go to work early the next morning, and you have put an undue burden on her, but you also told her that she's supposed to serve the man of God. Mm -hmm. Am I, I, I checking with you? Y'all checking with me? You think this is? Yes. And he says, it's oppression. Uh, and he says, you're, you're, you shouldn't be doing that uh, uh, to people. Uh, and so God uh, condemns those kind of things. Uh, the third one, that's found in verse number 15. Well, you try to prepare a scene since that's coming He said, you'll try to cause land and sea to make a single cross fight. That's the second side of it. And it looks like it's a positive thing. But what he's showing is this. He said, you're going to go out of your way, trying to make someone to, to, as a convert, but what you're doing is you're making them twice as of hell. In other words, you're not doing it for the right reason. You want them to be just like who you are. Yeah. And so I'm always, and I've been on this little kick here lately, but I hear people say it's all about souls, it's all about souls. And I want to know what do you mean when you say it's all about souls? Are you trying to make them like you and condemn them when they're not uh, like you? What do you mean when you say that? Because the scripture is indicating that if you're trying to make them a clone of who you are, and that's in fight in relation with God, then now you're leading them into a, uh, to become a uh, son of hell in the same way that you are. Please write this down. That uh, relationship trumps religion. That's important. I've been telling you, I said it in every uh, one of the sessions, that relationship trumps religion. What do you mean? I mean that uh, you may not know all the principles, and we found this out with uh, the, the Gentiles. They know all the practices of Torah, but we even had relationship, and through relationship, they found principles of God's word through relationship. So if you will take the time to develop a relationship, you'll know how to live appropriately. What do you mean? Well, if you take the time to have a good relationship with somebody, 
it's easier to do right by them if you build a relationship with them uh, as opposed to generically trying to love them, thinking that men like this and women like that, so since women like this, treat them this way. And that every man is the same, just like that every woman is the same. But if you treat them in a generic concept, then you're building uh, a, uh, your relationship, not really a relationship, it's just built on practice, it's not built on uh, relationship. The next woe is found in verse 16. What do you blind gods? It says you can destroy the temple. In other words, other blind gods because of this. He says you, you are uh, trying to link them into something that you yourself are not aware of. That you're trying to teach them principles and lead them in a way that you didn't understand why you do it, uh, do what you do. So you're swearing by the temple, swearing by the altar, swearing by the gold, swearing by heaven, and you didn't understand why you do these things, but you believe that if you do this, because what we've always done, that God's going to uh, honor this. So you want to know for yourself, why are you baptized? Why are you speaking in tongues? Uh, why is it necessary to pray? Uh, why? Uh, what is the rapture? What is, why do you uh, put washing? And you don't want to say, well, Dr. Turner said this, Dr. Turner said that, because then you're not, uh, you don't have a relationship personally with God. You're only seeing God through me. And each of us have to know God. My job is simply is to feed you with knowledge and understanding, to lead you into a place or a point where you become to you know God on a personal walk for yourself. Uh, I cannot, I did not die on the cross for you. I did not, I don't have uh, enough blood to die or shed for each of you. I have not been raised uh, from the dead by my own accord. I have no heaven or hell with which to uh, place you into. I cannot heal uh, your body. I just can't. Uh, and so my, my point is, brothers and sisters, that um, you're, I want to present Christ to you, the God that I know, but so that I can tell you about the God that I know, that you'll grow in relationship uh, and, and who he is as well. Uh, the next one comes in verse 23. He says, you pay the, you bring the, woe to you, Scott Pharisees, the hypocrites, you pay the tithe with men, deal, and cumin, but you neglect the weight of your the law, which is uh, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Similar to this, is that you, you do a right practice, you bring tithe, offer, and such, but you'll tithe, but you won't show mercy to someone. You'll bring offering, but you don't show love, or you don't show faithfulness. Uh, now here's how, how it affects believers. For instance, uh, as a leader, you don't want to be the pastor of the church and say church starts at 7 and you show up notoriously at 7.30 after everything's getting started. That doesn't demonstrate uh, faithfulness. If you want the saints to be there uh, at 7, then you've got to arrive uh, well before 7 to set a precedent, an example. Uh, if you want the saints to worship, you've got to be involved uh, in worship. I'll say it uh, uh, numerous times when I go places. You know, they'll, they'll say, you need some time to get yourself ready from the back office. And I'm saying, no, I'm ready now, let's go. Uh, and so what we, we get to go and I said, I'm not, I need to be in worship. Why? Because, first of all, worship lets me know uh, what the atmosphere is like that we're about to release this word. And it helps me understand that. And then also, if I'm engaging myself in worship, then uh, uh, I expect for people to listen to me if I take the time to sing and worship with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? No. So we're showing courtesies uh, to one another. Uh, that way, if we're, if we're uh, showing respect and honoring your gift, then you'll honor uh, my gift uh, as well. But if I disvalue your gift, thinking that my gift is far superior, so I hang out uh, in the, the green room waiting for, you know, my uh, Interest to come in and I expect everybody to, you know, to swell into the strength of when I walk in. What I've done is devalue your gift wow. and exalt my own. Is this making sense? Wow. Right. Uh, the, the, the sixth wall comes into the, uh, the nature of, of the individual. He says you, you, your cups look like on the outside, it looks so clean on the outside, but you're full of greed and self indulgence. That means outwardly, you know, you want to look the part, but at the same time, all you're doing is you're, you're looking out for yourself. You want to you know, hoard things uh, for your own self. Uh, it's things like, you know, trying to preach it into a frenzy so you can get a good offering from them. That's wrong. It's a religious spirit. It's actually manipulation. So you don't do those kind of things. 
uh, number the seventh wall, Father Verse number 27. He says you you have uh, whitewashed tombs, and so outwardly you're beautiful, but inside you're dead man's bones. That means, in other words, you're hypocritical in your appearance. You look the part of holiness, but your inside lets us know who you really are. What do you mean? Uh, your collar does not give you power. The chain across your chest doesn't give you power. Your bishop's cassock and, and, and the shamir uh, with the belt doesn't give you any power. When you put that on, you don't, you don't uh, become something, something greater than your power just comes up, up over you. If anything, it gets hot. You know, all those layers, <laughs> all those layers that you got on, but it doesn't give you any additional power because you have on uh, this swaying garment. As a matter of fact, the reality is, if you want to go right now to uh, any of, of those best of places, you can walk in to the kind of road that you want. They, go, they probably will not take your car. I've never seen them ever do it for me. They, probably, they won't take your car. They'll probably just stop to measure you, go in and fix you for any kind of road that you want to have on uh, because that they're looking out for more for your river. They don't even care about what position uh, that you're in. What do you mean by that? Because the appearance doesn't make you powerful. That's important. He just points it out to them. And then he says, the eighth wall is in 29. All these guys of Pharisees become hypocrites. You build tombs for the prophets, decorate the, uh, you decorate the monuments of the righteous. In other words, you say stuff like this. Uh, you'll say, you know, my family built uh, this altar. My family, we, we purchased all these chairs. That's my, my, my family. My family, we, we, bought, we bought that land. Oh, I, I, I bought all, all those windows you see. I bought all those windows. Uh, uh, what's happening there? Uh, it's a religious spirit. You are reporting yourself to be uh, important, and you're not. You're not here. You are. You want others to see what you've done. Monuments to yourself that you said were in the name of God, when in reality uh, it was about uh, wanting to be seen and recognized by men. Jesus, in that same chapter, then verse 33, he calls them uh, uh, snakes and a brood of vipers. In other words, he's saying you are like your father, the devil. Why does he say that? Because, remember, the first demonic possession took place in the Garden of Eden when the serpent was embodied by Satan. And so he's referring back to that event. He says, you're acting just like your father, uh, the devil. So then, uh, he indicates, so then your, your eternal place, your destiny, uh, will be hell. Uh, being of the devil, John 8, 44, uh, the devil was a deceiver, he's a liar. Uh, at the same time, Matthew 7, verse 15 says that they look like uh, sheep, but they're actually wolves that are in sheep clothing. In other words, they're deceptive, that's the religious spirit. They want to present themselves as being one thing when in fact they are something different. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13 to 15, Paul puts it like this. He calls it, he's assessing that the false apostles, the deceitful workers, they disguise themselves as the apostles of Christ. Uh, it's no wonder because even the devil doesn't, he does the same thing, he disguises them as an angel of light. Uh, therefore, it's not surprising that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Now, that's a very powerful text because what he indicates is this. Paul is suggesting that the, that the devil transforms and, as an angel of light. Why? Well, if he can't deceive the righteous, if he's acting unrighteously. Now, you got to consider this with the sisters. For most church people, we know it's wrong to murder. We know it's wrong to uh, do drugs. We know it's wrong for alcohol. We know molestation and rape. We know those kinds of things are, are wrong. Uh, we know that sitting around uh, a fire doing enchanted incantations and all that. We know it's getting, We know uh, that's not right. No, we know that you know, using Ouija boards. We should know. This yeah. stuff is wrong. We, we know that. Uh, so for most church people, you're not going to find them participating in those kinds of activities because they know that they're wrong. So the devil can't get you with that. He knows that for most church people, you're not going to go to a Kiss or Van Halen uh, concert. That you're going to you're, you're going to steer away from you know those kinds of events. However, uh, he can, if he can get you with something that appears it's innocent, it isn't wrong with that, it appears like it, it is very subtle, uh, harmless, uh, but yet it's tainted with 
uh, wickedness, that's where you get the seed. If the rest of the sites are going to do it, well, you know, since they're not wrong, you know, I can go do it uh, as well. But we can all go uh, and just make it in. So he will deceive us with things that are, that will look right, but they themselves are wrong. And that's how he got uh, Adam and Eve in, in the first place. So let's go through this lesson and build on what Jesus and Paul, because Jesus had, had presented to us about the religious spirit. The religious spirit is a, it's, it's a demon that uh, works to substitute the religious activity uh, for the power uh, of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. It substitutes activity for the power of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. Uh, it's seen in many way, ways like an act, an act could demonstrate then the grace of, of God. Uh, a, a demonstration could represent the grace of, of God. Uh, that one would believe that uh, their poise their position gets them to a place uh, where they can get away with things uh, in front of people. Uh, so the religious spirit substitutes the uh, power of God for a religious uh, activity. Uh, going deeper with that, it's a form of God that denies power. Paul tells us, 2 Timothy uh, 3, 5, from such people who do that, that he doesn't have nothing to do uh, with them. Religious forms are these and many more. It's an appearance, it's a structure, it's a ceremony, it's a formula, it's a liturgy, it's a, a ritual. Now, uh, I firmly believe and am quite confident that there are ceremonies and things that we would involve ourselves in. I am not saying at all that we just come to church and just you know, sit around and see, and see what the Spirit just does. For us, and if we, if we feel prompted to sing, then we'll sing. If we're just going to sit, we'll just sit and do whatever. Uh, I'm not saying that at all because uh, that is uh, unbiblical uh, as well. Uh, what I am suggesting, however, is that when the program supersedes the presence of God, when the agenda comes above the move uh, of God, when our, our ceremonies are more important than God himself. And if you see that happen a time, God will come in and his, his presence is just, just smacking us all around. Uh, and uh, uh, but we'll still have to push through to get to this certain point. Uh, I do understand at some points you know, there are um, where you've got to bring something in. I, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that there are obvious times where God's presence is so powerful that uh, it, it's a clear sign. Stop what we're doing. Let's give way to the Holy Spirit uh, as opposed to uh, forcing something ourselves to generate, and God is not uh, working uh, with that. It's the leaven. What, what is leaven? Leaven is yeast. Uh, leaven does not add any substance to bread. So if your dough weighs 16 ounces, you put yeast in it, uh, you bake it, your bread, after that is baked, still weighs 16 ounces. The form changed. What did yeast do? Yeast puffed up the existing substance. It added no value, it added no substance. All it did was puff up that was already, that was there. Uh, it is a prideful, conceited, um, arrogant concepts that come forth. And we have to be very careful because a holy look, uh, God hates it. He, it's an abomination to him when we uh, present ourselves as being better than uh, uh, other people. Uh, this religious spirit, it adds nothing to the power of the church or the life uh, of the church. But it feeds on the pride of man, uh, which caused Lucifer to fall, and that same false judgment that the Lucifer falls to that to us, causing man to fall. Satan's strategy is to work with your pride. You gotta get that. It's extremely important. He will work with your pride. So he is moving through your motive. So you really want to be questioning, why am I doing this? What's my purpose behind the, uh, doing this? Uh, because Satan is working with the pride uh, of an individual. Uh, let me also say as well, he will not only work with your pride, he will work with your fear. You may want to write that down. He works with your pride. He will work with your fear. So he has a false sense uh, of humility uh, where uh, you're saying, well, no, I'm not, I'm not good enough, Lord, you know, 
But you know, whatever God wants, I'm not, I'm not good enough. I'm not, I'm not good enough. You know, whatever God wants, I'll just do it. I, I'm, not, I'm not good enough. Brothers and sisters, you keep repeating the fact that you're not good enough. But you're going to do it because it's all you're not good enough. Mm-hmm. It's a false sense of humility. Mm-hmm. If you're not good enough, but you're still going to be used by God, mm-hmm. you don't have to tell us that you are not good enough. Mm-hmm. We all know ourselves that none of us are good enough. It's a false sense of humility. So you'll work with your pride, you'll work with uh, your fear. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. What do you mean, Pastor? Make it plain. I'm saying this. God offers more grace to the person who keeps going back to the altar every Sunday by asking for the same thing over and over again. Help me, God. Help me, God. Help me, God. And you might say, that, you know, they need to grow up as a shame. Sunday to Sunday, they keep going for the same thing. What's wrong with them? Uh, but the scripture tells us that we can find comfort for the throne of grace, to find mercy, to help us in our time of need. So it's better for you to keep coming to the altar for the same thing, getting prayer and living for the same thing, than to sit in your seat and not move and pride hold you back because when you think that you are messed up, yes, that's why we're here. We're all here. But should it happen when you step out, the person was out, just start walking with you. Right. No. If the truth be told, truth be told, the uh, altar call should be flooded every Sunday with sinners and saints. <laughs> because at some point in time, the word should find you somewhere. Mm-hmm. It should find you somewhere. You know, and uh, we should be coming at some point. You know, they can, you know, pray for me. Come help me. I've been saying it for 15 years, 20 years. Right? Somebody help me. You know, pray for me. You know, I'm still, I'm, I'm not there yet. If, if you're still the same place you were five years ago, something's wrong to go. If you're still the same place you were last year, something's wrong to go. If you're still the same place you were a month ago, something is wrong with the group. So we need some, we need some help, some sharpening, uh, some pruning to move us uh, about. The religious spirit wars against the grace of God. Wars against the grace of God. Uh, so it will substitute the act for the grace. Thinking in terms, I'll make it real practical. The bread at the communion doesn't heal you. The uh, uh, grape juice, the cup doesn't heal you. The oil. Olive oil, we call it olive oil. It does not run the devil away, and it not even does it heal you. Uh, brothers and sisters, you bought that oil at Giant, Mars, Shoprite, Walmart. All right? <laughs> you bought it there, you bought it, and you asked them, someone to, to pray over this oil. Their prayer did not magically change that oil. Uh, so if, if, it, if, if we're going to think it has some sort of power, we need sacred ground or sacred tree that, that this oil is we can move that particular berry, crush that berry that have more sense than just going to a mass produced place against olive oil and you just pick it off the shelf, bring it to the church and say, can you pray over this? And all of a sudden, boom, magic there it is. You know, this fresh this oil now becomes powerful and can run it the other way. Brother, that is uh, a substitution for the grace of God. The oil that doesn't heal you. Are you okay? <laughs> The bread doesn't heal you. The, 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 the grape juice doesn't heal you. It's a symbol of the grace of God. Mm-hmm. Alright? It's a symbol. So, what happens if, I, if I'm not in a place where I can get bread? Or, or for communion? It doesn't mean that I'm not in a, a good place of God? No. Because it's an only an act. It's an act that symbolizes a grace of, of God. I love that. Uh, so, I may not be, and, and here's something really important. They may never ever bring you up front, take the oil, and pour it over your head and say, we now consecrate you for eldership. And they may never acknowledge that. Yes, if you walk in a grace with God, in deep humility, I believe this. There are many elders who have never been acknowledged by the church. Mm-hmm. And I also believe that there's a whole lot of people that have oil put on their head and they've never been anointed in the first place. <laughs> but, because it was an act that did not release a power. The, the power of God, God puts the approval first, long before we ever do it uh, in the earth. Okay? That's, that, that's key and important. Uh, so, one of the foundations of these things is that the devil works with zeal. 
He worked with a person's zeal. Uh, zeal is a good thing, but it can also be evil. So he will work with a, a zeal to the point that your zeal uh, consumes uh, your love and relationship with God so that now you're all about a, an agenda as opposed to relationship. What do you mean? The reality is there are many schemes by which we can build churches and have many people in our churches, but it doesn't mean all people that are there actually have a relationship with God. So there are campaigns that we can do that draw people in. You, know, you give away gas cards. People come to church and give away gas cards. You, know, you give away uh, blankets and, and, and free food or, or toys. They will show up. Uh, if you give away, you say we're going to give away for your apartment. People who come to church, they will show up. You know, I saw this, I'm going to call his name, but I saw this pastor who was, you know, he did something very uh, belligerent uh, uh, a couple years ago. And then this past, this past Sunday, he tells the church, he gave away hoverboards. You know, he's driving around on the hoverboard and in the congregation, he's going to give away hoverboards. I'm, I'm cracking up laughing. I'm thinking, you know. <laughs> Now, I don't know if this is somebody to retrieve your name and all the crazy stuff that you did. Are you riding on, you know, on, on hoverboards? And what people come to church to get a hoverboard? Okay. I'll come to church. I mean, I'm just saying, I need that. You know, I'm like, I don't need a hoverboard. I'm just saying, so, you know, I don't need a hoverboard. I mean, you know, I can uh, eat different strings. I'm going to walk in. Of those who uh, they drank of that sex that were around the dwellers of the earth. 
That means the kings made intimate relations with her. People who were under them also joined along with her. He carried me with the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, that's in chapter 13, uh, and it had two blasphemous snakes and seven heads, ten horns. Same beast, verse 13. The woman was arrayed, watched her colors in purple, scarlet, adorned with gold, jewels, pearls, having one her, uh, in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of sexual immoralities, and on her forehead uh, was written the, the name of the mystery, Babylon, uh, the great mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. What's he showing us? He shows us, first of all, that this uh, under the woman is the, is the waters, that's the nations. Under the nations, uh, or above the nations, are the beasts. That's the Antichrist system. And atop of the beast is the woman. What's he going to show us? I need you to understand this church that if you're thinking that ISIS is going to be the problem for in the end time as the world dominates, you're starting to mistake it. Also, if you're thinking that these type terror groups, agnostics, atheists will be your problem. No, 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 no. Your problem will be those who profess to be Christians. Let me uh, present this. Uh, 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 a group of them, uh, some of our members came in and they were talking, we were just talking the other day. But if you, if you really look and see what's happening with radical Islam, uh, radical Islam is being targeted. Uh, they're targeting Christians, Jews, and so it's really not a, a fight about Western civilization as much as it is a religious warfare. So the jihadist concept is driven by religion and is not driven by oil and also territory. That's one thing. Then consider those who want to retaliate uh, against the jihadists. If you're honest with yourself, you're going to find out that it's the conservative Christians that were fighting against the jihadists. And they're saying, conservative Christians, exercising their, their amendments, let's pack up, let's get uh, exercise our rights for guns, so that we're not caught unaware, so if they come against us, we'll fight them back and shoot them down. Brothers and sisters, uh, and I'm alarmed with the concept that with even a group like Liberty University would encourage their students to do the same thing, to take up arms to fight against uh, the, these individuals, what happens with the power of prayer? Well, what are you saying, Pastor? I need you to understand, brothers and sisters, that uh, these kind of actions are religious movements. Okay? They're religious movements. And so, if our God is great, if He's great like we say that He's great, our Bible shows us He took Israel out with pictures uh, and lanterns. And it defeated a nation with a pitcher that holds water and a light uh, or a flashlight. Can you imagine that? What kind of weapons uh, are you using to defeat a nation? All you have is a, a, jar, a jar for water and a, a flashlight. But God defeated nations uh, like that. He told them, He doesn't go up and praise me. And they did show up praising God and they, they can even defeat it. He said, Walk around these walls. And, and then when you're finished, then shout to all the individual. And without any weaponry, they're walking around and they're shouting praise to God and walls come come coming down. What I need you to understand with the sisters is that the strength of the believer comes with the power of God and not the things yeah. uh, that you have or and you're also uh, your your weaponry. Uh, so I've said a whole lot. Um, let me get into the signs of religious spirits. And I'm going to relate to this so I can get to some definitions. Here are some signs of the religious spirit. Uh, Someone's offered the religious spirit when you see this. They oppress and they persecute others in the name of the Lord. So they're, they're bringing unnecessary judgments on people, oppressing them. I already talked about that one before. They criticize them constantly and they recruit others to join them in their constant criticism. They're manipulating and they're controlling, expecting or demanding the saints to, to do this or operate uh, like this. Uh, it's manipulative. Uh, and you're expecting the saints, do this when I say, uh, you know, uh, take my dry king to the dry hands. Uh, this manipulating, that, that is, it's controlling, but unforgiving and hypocritical. Here's one, you, you see this often in testimony service over and over again. Uh, the person will testify and they'll, they'll 
pretend as if some testimony that you're giving someone, yet in the testimony they keep bringing up their past or their pain. So they'll say, you know, saints, uh, I was hurt by so-and-so, and, you know, God called me to see so-and-so, and, -so and I, when I saw them again, you know, the Lord's going to listen. And I thank God that he's allowed me to move past them. That was that past Sunday, all right? Then that, that wind that comes out of this time, uh, thank I want to thank and praise the Lord that I saw so-and-so again, and when I saw them, you know, they, God, they hurt me, and then the, uh, 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 the Lord told me to do this, and I, so I did that, and I, I want to thank and praise the Lord because he's done this, and then, you know, then they'll pass on. Then, you know, can we say that you're here? Well, thank praise the Lord because, you know, uh, I saw this person, and, and y'all know they hurt me. Well, the reality is that you're not past your pain yet. You're hypocritically, you've forgiven them, but really you're working for them. Unforgiveness. Okay? I didn't tell you ahead of time that you'll be a little tight and first time. Right? Alright. Good. Uh, Y'all uncomfortable yet? Alright. Uh, Revelation of God, they push their own personal uh, agenda. Uh, they focus on perfection and not progress. They're proud uh, and, and arrogant. They find fault with others, uh, but they never see their own personal uh, faults. They know how to temper down, but not to, but by, they do that or they build themselves up. They're unable to uh, receive correction. They, they won't listen to man. They, they, God, the Lord's one to deal with this. I don't listen to God. God tells them to do. They don't have, they won't submit to uh, human authority. And, and so they, they, they'll say, well, I don't belong to the church because, you know, I don't believe in man who would do that. I let God tell them to do. What's really funny is that you get to the church and do what happens. You know, they'll take the church. But... <laughs> They won't be pastors, but they want to, they want, they want to pastor uh, uh, other people. Uh, there's a suspicion about the moves of God. You know, they think everything from the devil, everything. So here's how that works among our groups. That they'll, they'll tell us that we fellowship with each other. Don't go over there because uh, that's the devil over there. You know, you'll go over there. You know, we, uh, and, and then they'll, they'll become domineering in the fact that they'll tell you, uh, you check with me, and, and I'll let you know whether you can go fellowship with, with this church or not. Okay? That, that's control. That's the controlling spirit is domineering. And they should think that, you know, that they're the ones that determine that where God moved because they're suspicious about uh, whether God uh, will move like that or, or not. But uh, who's to say God can't? Well, uh, Peter walked by someone in his shadow and they were healed. Uh, so how come uh, someone can't be breathing and as they breathe out, somebody can heal? How can that happen? If Paul can pray for hands and aprons, uh, how come someone's clothes uh, take the dry shirts and he'll be the clean? Well, how come God can't uh, do this kind of thing? How, how come someone can't walk on the property and all of a sudden fall out of the Holy Spirit? Who, who said it can't happen? Uh, my, my uncle, and I, uh, uh, told him earlier when he was too, and I remember this distinctly. There was a guy who had uh, mental challenges. We called it something different years ago. We had mental challenges. And my uncle prayed for him that God would uh, touch and deliver uh, this guy. Uh, couldn't uh, live on his own. Uh, and because he had his mental disability. And uh, so he prays for him. God touched the boy so that now, to this day, he drives. He, uh, he's married a wife. He's got kids. He holds a job. And he's a barber. Uh, and he, can, he has... Uh, he's in his right mind because uh, the power of prayer took someone with mental disabilities and God healed uh, that person. So I'm saying to y'all, I've seen God, seen God do things like, like that. The same uncle got moved the mental powerfully. You know, he's older now and he can't get around like, like he used to uh, laying hands on people. Uh, so I've seen him just stand, lift his hand, you know, and to the side of you, you have a sickness, whatever, uh, stand, I'll pray for you. As he raises his hand, the car back begins to fall. All he's doing is just raising his hand. Mm -hmm. So who said that God can't move uh, like that? I've given this demonstration in other uh, services, so I'll do the same uh, with you. Unfortunately, uh, Jessica is closer to me, so I'm going to have to use her uh, as this uh, example. So we, we don't think God can move like that. So then what we do is we spend our time, and we're, we're working her and working ourselves. So we're, we're <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> uh, so we we do our our, our sex we go after those. Uh, so we was my time to oh God healing the name Jesus you touch the Lord you know what I mean? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> so after we've been through all that you know uh, she already had a, 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 she 
than she were. And we're, we had to make her at neck ache and all kinds of stuff, shaking her, thinking that that's how God can move. And how come he can't move if we just raise my hand in the air? But they're suspicious about uh, moves of God. They go in yesterday, so they're talking about what God did yesterday. You know? uh, all the time. God did this yesterday, and all the Lord did this. And, and they keep talking about yesterday so much that they didn't even tell us we didn't have any foresight of what God can do today. It's a real problem if all we do, and, and I, I was talking to Jay about this on Sunday, you know, uh, if we're still singing songs strictly from 1956 or 1856, that's a strong problem. Why? Because a song is an experience and a revelation of that writer that he's had, and he wants to explain that to people. So if we're singing Psalm 1856, 1956, then literally our move of God is stuck in 1856 and 1956. Does that make sense to you? We've got to about that experience. So we have to sing songs that speak to the day where God is moving today, where God's going to take us uh, today. Uh, that's why songs like, you know, that song of, of victory, he fights, we win. It means more to Zion because it's speaking to a revelation of that, that happened and we were exposed to. Uh, songs like, uh, we need your father in the fall, that speaks to where we are. We know uh, that's familiar with that thing. It means more uh, to us. So we need revelations like that. Uh, we need to see God move in our midst where, where we're praying for someone. And, and, and who's to say? Why can't uh, someone be in the a geneticist having a culture uh, under the microscope, having a power of God in his hand? See that culture or change. We got the healing power of God. We can manifest in that particular place. Uh, there's some things about dreams and visions. They like the place of the word of God. <laughs> we twist the scriptures for the whole justification. What do you mean by that? I mean things like, as a people, we still need to revisit uh, our doctrines. Uh, well, I discovered this to myself personally. I've noticed after the years of, of pastoring here, almost 15 years now, uh, that uh, after all these years, I look back at some of the things I started teaching when I first came, and I, I have expounded further on those revelations. I've also gone back and corrected mistakes that I've made because some things I thought I knew, I didn't really know. So I had to, because of progressive revelation, I found out, learning more, I had to change my concepts. So I believe that one of the errors of denominations and organizations is this, is that we will place a staple in our doctrines and we miss out on the true concept because we think that we have a market on that particular doctrine when in fact uh, we really don't. Uh, I want to give you, because we're talking about grouping, so let me give you real quickly uh, the groupings of, of, of demons, and I think that should be on your page three. I uh, cited so that there. Uh, I'll just type it real quickly and I'll kind of go through and explain them all. Uh, there's uh, judgmentalism, traditionalism, self righteousness, religious spirit. What I mean by demographic arrogance, demographic arrogance is this. That means we're, we're ministering in an area or to a group of people because we believe that group needs it more than the other. What do you mean? Uh, let's just say that this group here, that they, their homes are not at $250,000 over here. But we'll say, <coughs> this group over here, that they are in underprivileged neighborhoods. So what we do then, uh, we, and they have violence over here, they've got uh, it's drugs activity uh, over here. So what we do is that we'll set up a tent, or we'll have street services in neighborhoods like this, because we believe that they need uh, help, they need God, they need deliverance, uh, that's demographic arrogance, uh, because the reality is, they need God, but this group over here also needs God, okay, but demographic arrogance, or religious spirit, will cause us to target groups uh, that are like that, uh, rebellion, disobedience, stubbornness, delusion, greed, uh, strife, lust, uh, then a few bitterness, manipulation, doesn't know we'll dip over the dismal spirit, by, by itself, dictatorship, uh, his bond is witchcraft. Dictatorship will, will often make people stay in an area uh, believing that, 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 that the pastor is the only one that has the power and he doesn't foster the gifts of other people. Criticism, legalism, perfectionism, division, hypocrisy, heresy, unbelief, doubt, confusion, arthritism, deception, false, uh, holdings, false gifts, false truths, righteousness, that, that is. That is Reason of overplay, works of their motives, uh, guilt, condemnation, fear, fear of God, 
fear in the front where we're afraid that God will strike us down. So we're sending God out of fear, not out of love, but we're afraid of Him. Fear of losing our religion, fear of leadership, fear of new things. So fear of leadership to the point where, you know, we don't, we have, the leaders are surrounded by this mob of people, you know, they're, they're on the rod and we can't get to the leader uh, because we don't want to, if we touch them, we'll take away from their holiness. But in reality, Jesus was touchable that if you touched him, in transferred virtue. So we, people who are, if you're really that powerful, walk among us. So your shadow can pass over us. Let us touch your clothes after you finish preaching. So we can grab a hold of some anointing. Am I making sense to you? If Jesus did that, uh, how, and, and, and if he's that powerful, and you're that powerful, we need powerful people who've been among us uh, to deliver. We need you after a powerful move of God to shake our hand. Because if you move of God, that power flee. These kids and sisters, we constantly want to, you know, we, we don't want to get the word, move of God out like this, so we don't want a devil to enter in. But, sis, if you're that powerful after preaching and after praying for people, then that's the perfect time for you to shake somebody's hand. Because you can you deliver virtue uh, into them and make it sense to you. Uh, and if you're really that afraid, what you need to do is have that person that they're walking through, that's someone praying for them as they walk through the crowd. Because if they're really that powerful, they'll release deliverance of those groups uh, as opposed to have the demarcation that they are so holy we can't uh, touch them and also in tolerance. Uh, I am about to be grossly over my time, so let me end by this. Uh, I've cited for you on your fourth page a list of terms, and uh, I've defined uh, those terms. Uh, here, and I'm not going to be able to go through because time has uh, not allowed me to be able to do so. But there are a whole list uh, of terms you can see from there. And I've gone through and I've defined uh, what those terms uh, actually are on that fourth page. Uh, some of them just race through uh, some of these. And the anti evangelism spirit uh, is uh, believing that because someone is goth looking, that they're not worthy of salvation. Because someone is uh, struck out or, or demonic, that they're not worthy of salvation. Or uh, that we'll mention to this group because we, we identify with them, but we'll go over there because, you know, there's a little strength, anti-evangelism. Uh, uh, Anti-Christ infiltration, that's constant of the world coming to the church. Disguised uh, like pro-choice movements, homosexual agendas, doctrines of, uh, of inclusion. Uh, the uh, anti-miracle uh, spirit. Uh, is they don't believe in miracles at all, they believe God does miracles today, that died when the apostles died. The argumentative spirit, that's someone who has a habit of always picking, 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 picking. Uh, picking this, picking that, picking this, always finding something that's arguing, mad, 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 continually. Argumentative uh, spirit, the attention seeking spirit. This spirit is really strong with singers, worship leaders, uh, Preachers, uh, musicians, did I say that? Yes, it's very strong. Why? Because they'll do it for performance and not for the good of God. What do you mean? I'll give you an example. For instance, you know, someone who is highly gifted and can sing, uh, they'll sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll distinguish, they'll think because they can sing and do a run, that that means that they're anointed. But in reality, that they're just gifted. So it turns into things like, you know, they did the run once, they did the run again, and they keep doing this run over and over again. And we get it. You have good voice control. But enough already. In the song. God walked away from your song three minutes ago. And we're still stuck trying to be polite, you know, standing with you, as not to sit down with you. Does that make sense to you? Yes. We see choir directors do that. You know, they're, they're uh, you know, prancing across the stage, and, you know, they're, they end the song three times in the choir. And then we go back into it. We clap three times before we thought you were finished. And you go right back into it again. What's happening? It is an attention seeking. Is, is that too rough? Is that too long? Alright. Uh, and, and this, uh, maybe I should have said to you, uh, but they probably say, let me all say it. Uh, this is near and dear to me because years ago, I had a religious spirit myself. Okay? I'm, I'm letting you know this up front. I was there. God, God delivered me uh, from this, but I, it was very strong uh, in me. I'm glad that He delivered me from this before I became a pastor of Zion, because I, I was in honor with you. If I was the way I was back then, and pastor that, I would have wrecked this church a long time ago. I would have killed half of y'all, uh, you know, spiritually, because 
I'm going to cash in the hill really fast uh, because uh, uh, of the era and the mental state uh, that I was in. So Jesus had to arouse them, fall in on me, uh, allow me to see people who were in the car. This uh, whole bunch of stuff started happening. And it was this whole deliverance, purging concept for him to show me uh, the difference. Now it almost nauseates me uh, when I see the pretentiousness uh, in church over and over again. So I'm not speaking this to you uh, as to point out stuff. I'm speaking because I've been there. I know what it's like. Uh, I know you can deliver, but you have to know that there's something wrong. There's something wrong with me, something wrong with you, etc. And yet, yeah, I really want to be uh, delivered. Charismatic witchcraft. We don't get from another person. The show of spirit, like in the man or woman. Uh, or you can never grab me as well, uh, just pushing your, your how you feel personally of God's agenda. Uh, there is the church destroyer. That's the spirit that, that sabotages churches. They will foster or, or target groups of youth primarily and violence. They'll go in uh, and they'll get next to someone you know, in the youth to help them bring down the, the church through uh, conversion in youth ministries and also fire and even finances tear the church of the park or destroy it. Church splitters. Church splitters work like this. Here's what they do. Here's how you'll see them. Here's how you'll know them. They often profess their loyalties, their commitments to people. They'll walk in and, say, and you'll see them. You know, I love my pastor. I love my church. You know, and, they'll, and they'll start to pass themselves with uh, people that have influence in, in the church because they're spiritual, they love God, they love the church. And that, you know, they'll always keep telling you, I'm, I'm loyal, I'm loyal. Nobody loves uh, like I do. Nobody's loyal as I am. They'll do this uh, over and over again. Watch what happens because the first time you correct them, you'll know that that spirit is a church splitter. Okay? You'll know that because they don't receive this from well, but they'll profess how loyal they are. We don't need you to tell us your loyalty, but if you're loyal, just be faithful. Your faithfulness determines your loyalty, not your talk. Confusion spirit is perplexing this word. Always just kind of keep a mess up, keep a mess up. You'll know them by this. Their speech will often give them away. They'll, stuff, they'll say stuff like this. You know, I hate that. And I, I don't know why my name is always in mess all the time. I hate that. Well, it's probably because if your name is in mess, you are messy. All right? Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Okay? A contentious uh, spirit. Uh, they're always competing, competing, competing. You'll see a lot of times churches and pastors, preachers, going to preach one another. And I see this way. very strongly sometimes at conventions. Get mad because uh, someone was up the mic and the crowd got excited. And then they'll, then they'll say, you got all excited. So when I got up there, there wasn't nothing left for me. It's a convenient and to the point where they're behind the church over and they're almost going to blow but unpooping off, off the side. It's a convenient spirit. It's a con spirit of contention. The reality is if God moves the person that was in front of you and get this please, if the person, if God's glory was on the person who introduced you and you will rejoice to the person that would introduce you and they didn't rejoice while you were preaching, we probably because the glory was on your the introducer and not on the person that was bringing the message. Does that make sense? And it's not because the person that was going to bring the message was already in the wrong place in the first place. Hmm. The of healing is also through the wrong kind of thing. It's potions, um, pol uh, elixirs, could also be uh, acupuncture. People praying over water, saying, oh, Jesus, water, you'll be, you'll be better. And, and, and it's not the, uh, and I'm not against uh, water that's been prayed over. I'm not against it at all. Uh, I'm saying that if, if, if this special water is healing water, uh, then that's what we have problems uh, with, right? Demonic prophecy. The devil knows where you live, that's not deep. So for some of the things we live, the cover you have on, that's not deep stuff. Uh, prophecies come to uplift, to edify, even to uh, correct uh, the demonic revelations. Uh, God will give revelations to certain people, and some will not get them. And so if you're not getting revelations, uh, it may not be because you're not in the right gifting, uh, or, or you're not in the right place. But there are those who, out of jealousy, will have foster and enlightenment, hence 
uh, movements of the, of the environment, they all see an eye, they will nod third eye, which relates to the Freemasons, the Knights of, of the Templar, or the Eastern Star, and you know, other philosophies. Uh, denominational spirit, I don't have time to deal with that right now, uh, it's too much, uh, but it's, it's a horrible spirit. The, you know, I will park here just for a half a second uh, and say this very candidly, uh, very transparently. The Diva spirit uh, has hit the black church um, and uh, or in, I also even say the ethnic church in horrible, horrible ways. Diva uh, is where you exalt the, the, the woman believes that she is uh, she, it's a, first of all, it's a god, it's like she believes that people should follow after her, kind of like trying to ask the pipe, so she selects the light out of others, she likes to be the attention. Uh, so you'll see this oftentimes, with, and please take this in the wonderful, delightful, graceful, loving spirit that I choose to live in this end. You'll see this in uh, co pastors, first ladies, prophetess, so on and so forth. You'll see that, that pipe and spirit uh, moving, or they're, they're gloating for attention, desiring attention, desiring to recognize, being mad when they're not recognized. Let me go through this and say this now. Aquila and Priscilla were not co pastors of a church, they were a traveling team of evangelists. So God never intended for them to be co pastor, uh, husband and wife, pastor the church. It's not in the Bible. Check it out. You'll also see this as well, that the term First Lady is never in Scripture. We did that stuff. Okay? That's us. We did that. So since we did those kind of things, then we made people have these uh, uh, iconic God-like spirits. And, and the truth is, um, when we did that, not every First Lady has the capability to preach or lead. Didn't have the grace to do. And so you give an unrealistic expectation of someone who didn't have the power to do it. She's just a lady that happened to be married to pastor. Mm -hmm. I guess it's just like expecting for Priscilla Obama to do something. You know, she just happened to be married to a rock. And so now they expect her to, to look a certain way and, and they, uh, she was divided for a long time. Now she's praised and he's divided. But expecting her, she, she, she will never be a, a bush because she didn't, she didn't come from that culture. So to hold her to the standard of other first ladies of, of a country uh, is wrong. She can only be who she is. Is that the right thing? Right. So our points are that uh, this diva concept, we did that, uh, and uh, so we're, we're suffering, we suffer for those kind of things uh, in church today. Evil auto bearers, uh, they only serve for what they can get uh, out of it. Is no humility involved in that, is uh, what they want uh, out of it, recognition. Uh, position. Really funny because uh, you'll often see auto bear as one. You know, when a big preacher's coming to town, then they, they want to jump up an auto bear. And they, they don't have an auto bear to the time. But when a, a big name is coming, you know, I'm coming out of the time. Oh, you'll we'll sit down somewhere. Yeah. You know, I'm going to go back to the place of water, I'm going to go back to the place of water, I'm going to go back to the place of some special churches sometimes, and you know, they're very popular, and, I, and I'll go in and I'll, and I'll go, I'm going with you. I'm like, wow, you're going to go? Don't come today, get up on the sheep church. It's the wrong reason, wrong moments. Come and bring back one of the three people. It's like this. All right? Uh, evil health ministries. I mean, good because you, you want to take from people. False word, false compassion, I'm out of time, false uh, curve back movements, false compassion, false consecration is the demonic consecration. You're fasting for the wrong reasons. You're fasting for power, fasting for influence. You're praying for power and influence. Hear me clearly. God never told you to pray or fast for power. So when we sing the song, power, power, Lord, we need your power. Well, he's in the power of the Lord, he's got the Holy Ghost. So, uh, if you sing the song, I'm not asking you to be the Holy Ghost. So, you just, you know. So, if you're fasting, if you're fasting for power, then you're fasting for the wrong reason, and that's the law. Because they never told you to fast for power. It's just you're going to tell me, well, this kind of comes up my fasting brain. If you check what he's just saying, you're going to get the power to cast off the devils. 
So he already has the power to cast the devil out. So what's he mean? He's not saying that they can be fast to cast the devil out. He's saying you need to fast to humble yourself because the reason why you can't cast it out is because of your humility. Meaning, you would cast all the other devils out and now you think you're, you're somebody and because you're not humble, you better more devil you can pass out the, the, the cast out because you have to humble yourself. Okay? So fasting will right for the right reasons. False doctrine, false faith, false gifts, false preaching, false preaching, false preaching, false preaching for money. Like preaching to raise money, raise the offering, etc. And you know, the people who tell you, you know, that my money is to raise an offering, that's a, the devil's lie. There is no anointing to raise an offering. Okay? I'll say it again. There is no anointing to raise an offering. There is a wicked spirit that will make you to raise an offering. And so I'm out there, I'm out to say this. For most preachers who raise an offering after they're finished preaching, it's because that offering is going to them. Yes, I said it. And then they give me the back of the offering and put it out there that if they don't give me an offering, right about what it comes to me. Okay? Not farther than that. So often ask me at times, like, what places you know, you want to receive an offering? And I'll say to them, you know, if the Lord needs you to do it, I will. If you didn't never do it, I'm not raising an offering that God never told me to raise. I do believe that there are moments where God begins to do, and it prompts people to give. We see it here. Well, uh, all of a sudden, uh, people just start coming in, they start bringing an offering. And so people start coming in. No one knows them to do it, they just start doing it on their own. What happened? The Spirit began to prompt that a need for uh, see here. And I also believe that the time devil will give a thought and idea to it of the preacher. So we do the same thing. Uh, false prophecies, uh, false prosperity, false religion, false prosperity, false, uh, uh, false words, friction, uh, spirit of uh, guilt, spirit of negative, negative, persecution, quarreling, rejection, the spirit of a swindler, uh, the ugly spirit, the uh, violent spirit, uh, the vulgar spirit, and the witchcraft. Brothers and sisters, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do that. That's it. Um, the spirits are at work in the world today. Um, and I'll say this in my closing. Uh, knowing I had to deliver the messages that I had about talking in reference to what God wanted to know, I wasn't going to tell us. I didn't know what I was going to tell you. It was about 30. That's the spirit that didn't tell me. Uh, like noon, uh, but I feel prompted now to this uh, On Saturday night, on Sunday, uh, I was uh, visited by a prince of darkness um, in, my, in my dream. And uh, the spirit came, and uh, he has these enormous things. He was a gargantuan. Um, had it on his uh, red leather, like long jacket. Um, Collar on one side, down on the other side, uh, silver spikes all down the, the, the jacket. Uh, stern face, but, but handsome. So it wasn't gory, so I wasn't looking like, like, you know, I was just in awe of how massive uh, this spirit was. And in, in, in my, as I'm there, I, I say, I ask, who are you? The spirit gave me its name and then said this to me, but you will call me. You will not move. That's what he said. And I said, No, I won't. He said, Yes, you will call me. You will not move. And uh, so from 2 o'clock to about 5 30, uh, I'm fighting, um, declaring the scriptures, declaring the name of Jesus, declaring the blood of Jesus, uh, declaring the power uh, of Jesus over and over again. Uh, and I was on 40, on 40, on uh, 40, standing outside on 40. That's where the, where the dream took place. And, and uh, so it lifted about 5 o'clock in the morning, got up, came to church, and I knew I was in for something like when I came to church to fight through and pray uh, in, in the spirit, etc. And I knew God had to have something special at the end of the service. He's going to do something somewhere. Uh, to way they just told me earlier, so you're in the room. Um, Yesterday, I arrived in the office. I didn't know where I was on 40. I just knew I knew. I just knew I was on 40. So yesterday, when I arrived in the church, I'm not going to tell you where the area is. Uh, I'm arriving. I, I get to the stoplight and I see this house, and I notice for the first time the Confederate flag hanging on the inside of that person's house. 
That's what is interesting, you know, that's, that, that, that was that before. Joe Moore didn't make no decision, but leaving all of a sudden saying something um, yesterday evening about that, and then all the way home. And as I'm going down, coming to the St. Carrie's and driving through it, I feel this eerie that comes over me. As I'm in the area, and I'm like, oh, no, what is this? So as I uh, go through that line, I turn and I look in my mirror and I see this face in the mirror. The reflection laughing at me, silent laughing uh, at me. Uh, as if to say, I told you, you, know, you will not remove me. I knew, I, I'm telling you this because uh, teaching like this doesn't just uh, affect you, it affects me. Okay. I get that. I understand what I'm up against. Uh, I know, I, I realize he's that prince that rules over the over four. And I know why he was there, and I know why he, was, he didn't look ugly because the, 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 the uh, perversion spirit that runs up and down court is not trying to attract ugliness, it's trying to seduce. I get that. So he looked like that uh, for a reason. Uh, so I know, I, I know what I gotta do to get that. Uh, brothers and sisters, I need you to understand that this type of teaching will not only make you uncomfortable, but it will also we can expose something in your house as well. You need to take lessons that we had just like this. If you felt uncomfortable in any kind of way, if you felt this was too close to home, if you felt like that portion of this may have been you, okay? Um, be honest. Don't I guess if you lie, you only hurt yourself. Seek the limits. Know that that it's all right uh, because you just didn't know that uh, these things were occupying on the inside of you. But you'll also find out that if you admit to it, uh, acknowledgement and knowledge will bring deliverance. You'll get free a lot sooner. You can command that spirit to go from you because when you are at the side, you are no, no longer on friendly terms. You got to get out. Um, then you can command it. You have find that there's a freedom that's there. It's, it is. It is so liberating. I cannot explain to you. It is so uh, liberating uh, to be removed from the pretentiousness. Mm. So liberating. You mean this is just not me and you and me hang out with? But that's cool too. Uh, because I found out in replacement of my former relationships, I have a deeper relationship with God. And I'm telling you, the flood of revelation that you've been giving me through this, I would have never gotten that. And I stayed in my religious spirit. But this stuff has been dropping on me. I, I, I absolutely love it. It is great. It's powerful. Uh, I've been drinking this world. I would not go back and do what I did. I, I knew what I did in the past. I'm glad. I wish I had done it soon. Now, I will challenge you in doing this. Um, make it a point this week to no longer than, no less than, no less than 15 minutes a day. 15 minutes a day. Pray out loud in the Holy Ghost. Only in tongues. No English. Out loud. 15 minutes. And then you Okay. Now, so what's going to happen? Uh, first and foremost, uh, we're going to put your, your spirit in an uncomfortable place.
every time that you're, uh, you're in the house, or if maybe your child goes out somewhere, friend, brother, whatever, and they're always sick when they come back, um, you need to start checking some of that stuff. Okay? There are spirits and curses that are attached, and we have to be delivered by not breaking those contracts. One of those things is our voice and not your commands. I had someone come today, I just can't take your sickness. So I said, Mr. Dan, I said, have you stopped doing your declarations? They said, yeah. I said, well, when you were doing declarations, were you sick? They said, no. I said, go back and start doing your declarations. Brothers and sisters, those declarations are given notice. I said, you pray in the Holy Spirit because now you're going to start talking. Uh, you're going to start talking kingdom language, which will translate to demons as demonic language. They'll, say, they'll start saying to like to you. Oh, so you know my language? You'll say back in them, you know, yes I do. And you'll tell them to go. While you're praying the Holy Ghost, God may drop someone's name on you. You may drop a word on you. Uh, if you drop someone's name and you know that that person is in, in trouble, go deeper in the Holy Ghost and start praying personally in the Holy Spirit. Because what you're doing, you're fighting that principle, uh, that principle that's there to remove that bondage. Sometimes I would just start telling you, why are you praying with us? I love you. If he said it to you, you'll know this. That at that moment, you're telling him, I love you too. So take advantage of that exchange of love that's going on in the Holy Spirit. You're going to find, uh, and here's how I'll, I'll know. I'll know, I'll know Sunday uh, whether you did it or not. I'll know about the service. I'll know about your behavior. And get it. You won't have to pretend it because we'll that will also be wrong. Uh, the, the reality will, will, will kick in. You'll see the, the true power of God. Father, thank you. Thank you for this moment. Praise you for this time. Uh, and I know there's a lot. I get it. It's a whole lot. Uh, we, need, we need stuff like this in our lives. We need, we need transformation. Devil, we are so sick of you. We can't. We hate you. We hate what you stand for. Thank you, Father. And your name is Grace today. And we love you all. 